So it's Pastor Jean and I, it's our privilege to be here and we're going to be at the INC National State Conference on Tuesday, Wednesday. So we're loving Newcastle, we're loving this beautiful area. And notice right now at the window there, see the sun has just come out? I've taken here and I brought some of the sunshine state love. So I've got some fancy titles behind me, so don't be impressed by that. But what I might do is can we distract that? Um, and to save me explaining what I do, the powers of technology will come in right now. See how I'm giving Josh, Pastor Josh, an extra 10 seconds there. And you're going to show a bit of a video of what CMC does and what we're all about. So thank you, team, when you're ready. Oh. Thanks for clapping. Most churches clap when we finish. I just find that so inspiring because this is the land that God's got my wife and I to run in. Um, I, was, I did a Bachelor of Ministry. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. I did that 20 years ago, and it literally took me to a new level of effectiveness. But if you've got a Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning. It's really good to be with you. It feels like family. I tell you what, we had a great dinner last night and there was a lot of laughter in the place. I think uh, all the tables around us all scattered because there was too much laughing and too much joy. Uh, Jessica, because that's what it's like at your family dinner normally. A lot of, a lot of Yahoo, a lot of good. Apparently, it's, we do a lot of fun here. Seriously, seriously. It's, it's very seriously, all right? So three random things about myself so that you can stop checking me out. We can move on to the Word of God. Fire. I really like Fire. Number two, I like English Premier League football, and my team is uh, Tottenham Hotspur. And any any Chelsea fans out there this morning? Yeah, okay. I see. I see that hand. We can pray for things later on. And number three, I love developing and coaching people. It's something else I do on the side, and I really love seeing people grow and flourish to become all they need to become. Coming back to fire, I hang around with a bunch of guys in teenage years, and so. We would uh, go camping and we were taught as part of a camping program how to make fire properly. So much so that we would have creative ways of starting fires like um, dipping a, a toilet roll in kerosene and then having it with a big wire into a tree and then we'd tell a story and then someone would light it and it'd come down into this big fire. Whoa, wolf, like, it was wonderful. And I was, I was at a, an engagement party recently with some young adults and they're all around a fire and I don't know about this generation. They just don't know how to make fire properly. <laughs> they were putting leaves on it and stuff like that. I'm thinking, what do you need? You need the tinder and the kindling. T -t -tinder, tinder, friends, is not something you swipe left or right about. T tinder is this type of wood which helps you make fires good. Some of you got that joke. I am with the right crowd today. Different types of wood. And you construct a fire properly so that burns and burns and keeps on burning. Tottenham... Hotspur is my team. Harry Kane is my favourite player. He's the captain of England at the moment. But he was identified as a 14-year-old young lad. And through a series of development and training, he's become the EPL top scorer three times, got the golden boot. And now what he's done now is he's also known for giving the most assists, which is he's the guy who gives the pass before the person scores the goal. Someone 14 years of age, top goal scorer, now helping other people. The third area that I like is the area of coaching and development of people. I remember the first youth pastor I put on in one of my churches, I wanted to strangle the guy. He was uh, blowing stuff up, offending parents. I was always sending him off to apologise to people. But through a series of coaching and development processes, he's now leading a campus of a large global network of churches in our country, took over a church that I did and now he's running as a young guy, so 1,250 people on a Sunday. It's just an amazing thought that people can develop and grow. And I think these three things I've just told you about, fire, Harry Kane and power of coaching this young rat bag who turned good, literally illustrate a principle that is contained in the Word of God. And I want to encourage you, I want to inspire you this morning. And while things generally, if left unattended, decline downwards, it is possible to see progression and growth if we put some key things in place. And over time, friends, things are meant to grow. Over thing, times are meant to mature. We could all go like this and go, from little things, big things grow. You know, I'm feeling comfortable if I start singing. You know, I'm really comfortable if we start getting even to do push-ups. But that's for another time, all right? There is an expectation that things can. And I believe the Word of God instructs us that things, something should get better over time. As a follower of Jesus Christ, my life should start to look more and more like him over time. 
as the Word of God takes root in my heart and takes deep root, as I obediently follow Him, as I relate to Him in prayer, the community of people around me, and with my focus, I should start to see the fruit of that relationship start to mature over time. And over time, people should start to notice the progression of the character of God in my life. For example, here's one verse I'm going to put on the screen behind me. And this is a verse that meant a lot to me as a young believer, as a young follower of Christ. And this is 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. The NIV wrote, reads this, And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Another version of the ESV, which says this, And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And then a power finish here with the message says this, All of us, nothing between us and God, our faces shining, with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. See the, 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 the challenge for progression and growth and ever increasing greatness and glory. Can you imagine, would it be crazy if babies did not grow up and mature as planned? I'm not asking you to nudge anybody in the room here right now, but can you imagine an adult sitting next to us in nappies? But they never actually grew up or become they're meant to be. But some of us who've been around church life and pastoral life for a while, it's like some people have lived one year of Christian life 20 times over. They've lived the same year of development, have never grown up, and they're still, they're adult Christians, but they're still speaking baby language. I'm just thinking, how is it that people do not grow up to become more and more like Jesus and lose the childish ways that we have, um, we're supposed to live when we're baby Christians? I, I, I have sort of worked it out, and there's been some changes I've had to make to my approach to my relationship with God, and I want to share one of those thoughts with you today. And I grew up in church with this quite simple understanding, which is like this. The Bible is the basic rule of faith and practice. And it was basically, read this book and do it. It was great. Read this book and do it. And the underlying ethos of this sort of simple idea was a desire to obey God and to live according to His will. This much is clear. But I did as I mature, began to mature and walk and progress in my walk with Christ, I began to realise the underlying ethos of this approach was to obey God, was to live according to His Word. But by adopting such a simple approach, many of us may have looked, overlooked the clear biblical instruction towards a deeper thinking and a deeper engagement with what the Bible was actually telling me what to do. So I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm preach number two or preach number three, but you've got a series called Seeking God. So this morning is about seeking God through His Word, but also seeking God through His Word and being open for clear instruction from the Word of God. Some of us have said, Jesus, you are my Lord, but you haven't agreed to this, Jesus, you are my teacher. Jesus wants to instruct us. He wants to show us the ways of wisdom. And it's more involved, a little bit more complex than just doing the Bible, reading the Bible and obeying it. And that's good. God is calling us to go to a deeper level of understanding exactly what the Word of God is instructing us to do. So I've started to look at this as part, part of my own journey. And I'm now instructing other students and other leaders to take on more um, a clear understanding of the Word of God. I don't know about you, but the world I live in has literally gone mad. You go to Google, if you want truth, you go to Google and you look in something and all sorts of stuff comes out at, out at us. And I read what some Christians put on social media. And I think, have you ever read the Word of God? Have you ever considered deeply what the Word of God says? Because those statements, as I understand, do not line up with the Word of God. They're well-meaning, but it, it's... um. 
it's, it's sort of flavoured with woke Jesus kind of stuff in there. And I'm thinking, what has happened? And I'm, I'm going to bring a call. Is it okay that I can, because I'm going to fly in and fly out. Is it all right that I can just throw a couple of grenades here and get a bit of a giddy up? And then what it does is make Pastor Bill look really good. Oh, Pastor Bill, we love you. You know what I mean? We love you. You don't talk as tough as that young blow-in preacher that you got coming in. But, uh, but I've started to investigate several passages within Paul's letters that would seem to challenge us to move from this basic position and to move what I would call towards Christian higher education, a higher level of learning, more structured and a bit more measured as we dig deeper into the Word of God, move from the milk towards the meat and the potatoes and the Wagyu beef and the steaks and the thick steaks of the Word of God. So my investigation started in 1 Corinthians. Now, this, this, this thought is around the idea of knowledge and transformation. And in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, now 1 Corinthians was literally, Corinthians was a gateway city. Um, a, a lot of merchant and commerce happened in that city. It was, a, it was a key city and you had lots of smart people educated in there, but you had lots of business people in there. So I don't know if you're an, ed, an educated person or a business person or you're wanting to understand a good life. The book of Corinthians is, is a good book for you to read. Chapters 1 to 4, Peter's, uh, Paul's talking about some fights that are going on within the church and it's a result of some people in the church taking sides on a particular issue. Now, as I look across this audience right now, this congregation, the family of God, you look all reasonably well connected. I don't think there's ever any fights or any divisions. You look like you're all in unity, aren't you? Is there anybody sitting next to somebody they should be sitting next to? Let's all bow our heads in prayer, shall we know? There's a sense of... Paul's trying to address these divisions and there's this conflict going on. And, it's, and if it's left un, un, unanswered, the community of grace and love that's been established there will begin to unravel. And he begins his argument in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 as follows. He says, I implore you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you speak the same language and there not be divisions among you, but rather that you be made complete, see the Greek word there, kertesimoi, in the same, in the same mind, Greek word noi, in the same person, nomi. See, there's three, there's three Greek words there, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. The term here, kertesimoi, comes from the Greek word kartismo, referring to putting something together in order and putting it in its proper condition. It says here in Galatians 6.1, the same word is used when Paul tells the church, if anyone is caught in sin, the people who live by the Holy Spirit, the holy ones, are to restore or katanoizoi that person. See the same word, restoring. The same word is used again in 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians. Can I have a little bit of water? I can just see I'm really going to get busy here today. Thank you, my love. Thank you. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. Paul desires the church, he, he, he desires to return to the church after being separated from them so that he can supply, kartazoi, what is lacking in their faith. And the author of Hebrews prays that God himself will equip the believers, which is the Greek word there is in, is kartazoi, with everything good that we need to do the will of God. As a power close in Luke 6 verse 40, Jesus reminds his disciples that a student is not above their teacher, but a student that is fully trained, cardazonimus, is like their teacher. Regardless of the Greek word, and I'm not trying to impress you just because I pretend to be a Bible college lecture, but to let you know there's a key theme all throughout the writings in the New Testament, especially around the life of Paul, we're going to call it the K word. The K word talks about being fully trained about this idea that instruction, that development is a very important principle for those who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. And, it, and, and there's many other examples, which I've got in my footnotes there. But the big idea is that there is transformation and development that must occur through the process of instruction. Paul's desire as a father, spiritual father, of the church there, his desire for the Corinthian people 
is that they be made complete as a church, that they must resolve their divisions and their differences so that they can become a unified church. And for this to happen, they must be united in both mind and in purpose. And both of these terms, I believe, have educational connotations. And the first term, noose, literally transmitted mind, refers to the intellect. It refers to our understanding and our, our way of thinking. This is what God wants to do a deep work within us this morning, friends. The second term, nomi, G-N-O-M-E, was translated purpose here, has other other nuances, which means things like our opinions, our judgments, our way of thinking about an issue, our Facebook posts, our Instagram th- uh, in, um, in, interactions, what we say at a coffee over with each other as we do this life of faith together. In other words, Paul sees a solution to the Corinthians divisions and he says this, instruction about the things of God is very important. Instruction about the things of God is a hallmark of a New Testament believer. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, he goes on to say this, that their divisive behaviour is childish and immature. He calls them mere infants in Christ. He tells them that he's unable to teach them the meteor wisdom, the wagyu beef of wisdom they so desire, but he can only give them milk because they haven't yet developed the ability to be mature in the things of God. And this educational imagery, friends, is so obvious, and particularly in light of this discussion around the divisions. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, he refers to the church as God's building and himself as a wise builder, master builder, committed to the task of building upon Christ as the foundation. See, the language he's using is very, very important. And there's very little doubt from this that the Apostle Paul understood his role as a teacher, as a builder of the body of Christ, and he believed his role was to instruct the church towards transformation and maturity that people would look at the church and go, they are the people of God. It's a wonderful thought. Well done. I'm a bit of fanboy on the Apostle Paul. He's just one of my absolute heroes. And friends, when that happens, when we grow and when we become more like Jesus, this is growing the way that God wants us to grow. We grow in our gifts and call. We grow in our heart to love towards other people. We move towards this wonderful goal of unity and maturity and responsibility in the things of God. And it becomes the very life the very spirituality that is attractive to other people. This is the heart of the the Apostle Paul. And he says, let's seek God's Word. Let's seek God in His Word. And let's be instructed. Let's be instructed and let's grow together in the things of God. He also demonstrates this in some other passages, like in Philippians 1, 9 and 10. He prays that the church's love would abound increasingly in knowledge. I think I've got some key words up there. Look at that. Some of you could take a screenshot of that or I'm happy to release my notes to you so you can come and check my Greek too if you like. But it says here, you increase in knowledge and in depth of insight. And as as a result of this, they'll be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. This is one thing, friends, Google will not do. It will give you knowledge and a version of truth with a lowercase t, but it won't give you wisdom. It won't give you discernment about the grey areas of your life, which are very important. This only comes, friends, by seeking God in His Word and humbling yourself and saying, God, I want to be instructed by Your Word. And as we learn how the instruction of God, the deep teaching, the the life-giving Word of God can filter in our heart and give us a discerning heart to know what to do. Any parents in the room will know this. If you've got two or three children, you can't parent them all the same way. You need discernment. And this is why kids pick you off. Oh, yeah, but mum, you said yes to them on this. Why don't you say no to you yeah, know this? Because it is my discernment as your parent. This, this is what we're talking about. Sometimes knowledge does not work consistently, but discernment and wisdom does. And this is what brings great, great benefit. I know when we had to discipline our children, my son just... One thing of physical discipline. Thank you. Imagine what would happen if I come around and just poo, kick that water all the way to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be good? Eh? That's good. Eh? 
Yeah, I get paid five bucks for saying Tulsa, Oklahoma, but that's why the whole ground erupted like that. <laughs> yeah, it's just like you need to sermon as a parent. It's not about the knowledge of what to do. It's a how to apply. No, wisdom is applied, discern knowledge, which is right and perfect for that time. Friends, I believe this doesn't come by just listening to podcasts on the internet of other preachers. It takes the, we seek God daily, regularly in his word with a humble attitude. God, instruct me with your word today. It says in Timothy, Paul said to young Timothy, over time, if you apply these things, other people should be able to observe your progress. I don't know about you, but the older I get, I don't want to be the same as I was last year. I don't, they say the Bible says the way of the wise winds upward. I want my life to continue to be more fruitful, more gracious. I know this doing serious study, which God's called me to do. I'm moving in new levels of humility that I've never knew, moved before. That's, that, that's the sign of good instructions, friend, that you become less proud and more humble. If your study's making you more arrogant, more prideful, you might want to change your study because the rest of us don't want to hang around you, right? <laughs> is this true or is this true? true? I'm not coming back next week, so I've got to say all my stuff here right now. <laughs> God is good. So God wants to see us um, understand this correlation between knowledge and behaviour. As we spend time in the Word, as we're instructed under the power of under illumination of the Holy Spirit, people should be able to see that the knowledge and the instruction of God has changed to a new life, a more like Jesus, it should be reflective in our behaviour. That first term there, epignosis, is, a, is, is related to the word gnosis, which is typically understood as knowledge of information. The next one I said there is the ability to discern knowledge. And the knowledge and discernment, Paul says there, he prays, will lead to holiness and readiness for Christ's return. See the behaviour change, see the character change that happens when we're sitting under good teaching and we imply it and we seek God through his word. We, this, can I say, this is how we teach at CMC. We've got four H's that we do, head, heart, hands. And if we get all that right, we should see transformed habits. We teach your basic Bible knowledge, but as that knowledge goes into your head, it literally should drop into your heart and transform your heart your emotions, the way you, the heart for humanity that we have. And then literally we should see an outworking transformed head, a transformed heart should lead to transformed hands where we're practically applying the love of Jesus Christ. And it's almost for some people, it is evident through hugs of healing and helpfulness to other people. See how I cleverly just added another three H's there? My four H's become seven H's. But over time, this is what the people of God, the people of the rock at Salamander Bay should be known for. Oh, that's the church that always does that. They're always kind. You, over time, head, heart, hands should lead to habits. This is what you are known for. Yeah. So when people outside look inside this church, what do they say that you're known for? You don't have to yell out right now. But what are they known for? When your name pops up in another circle, what do they say to you? Oh, he goes to that church and what comes after next? Wouldn't it be nice to know that people may disagree with our biblical teaching, but they say those guys are so kind. Those guys are so generous because we always see them kind and we always see them generous. Head, heart, hands and your habits and this is what you are known for. It's a wonderful way to live. Um, again, in Colossians 1 verse 9 and 10, Paul prays the following, and I've got this up on our screen. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. See that again? Head, heart, hands, and the habits. And this prayer of Paul's comes in response to the imminent threat from probably Jewish heretics in the church. The truth of God is under attack and being diluted by ratbag elements. And Paul makes it clear that the only way to overcome such a threat is to be filled with the knowledge of God and with all wisdom and understanding these are both prominent terms in, new, in Greek education in the New Testament days. So it is important in a world where people are seeking truth, and hopefully some people come and seek truth in the church, 
that we don't just have lower case T versions of truth, but with the people of God, we are known to have capital T versions of truth. The life-giving truth, which literally brings help, healing and wholeness to those people who desperately seek it. Again, and finally, in Ephesians 3, 18 to 19, Paul prays that the church will be able to grasp the full dimensions of Christ's love, that they would know this love that surpasses all knowledge and may be filled with the fullness of God. And we can see here the instructional, educational goal of the Apostle Paul as a spiritual father, as an early church leader. In fact, the whole New Testament, his educational ideal is this, that good instruction will counter heresy, It's a method of producing maturity. It's a process by which we attain the fullness of God. It is the way to transformation. And number five is the whole package of living together with integrity. Our head, heart, hands, mouth, actions, and our habits all working together to bring glory to God. Some of us need to know the Word of God more, friends, because there's all sorts of crazy stuff out there that's being promoted in the church of God by some people. Like as a Bible college principal, I'm, I'm wrestling with that sinless perfection, crazy doctrine that comes down. A lot of young people thinking we don't sin anymore because people have been giving false teaching in our church. And I've had to counsel some of those who do fall into sin. And they said, but we were taught that because Jesus Christ in our life, we don't sin anymore. And it just messes people up. Bad teaching and bad doctrine just messes people up. Could I encourage the Rock Church to continue to be a, light, a, a, a lighthouse in this area for truth with a capital T, yeah. that you continue to speak the truth in love, that you continue to know and dig into the Word of God, to dig deep. The people who walk through these doors know they'll always get a solid word and it's a good word. Would you, would you just agree with me today, please, to continue to be so, so the Apostle Paul doesn't have to write a letter to our church, all right? Dear people at the Rock at Salamander. All right, so this, this, friends, is what I call Christian higher education. It's Christian instruction. It's just not reading the Word of God, but it's taking it further to meditate on it, to chew on it, to sit under the authority of the Word in God and say, Jesus, you are my Saviour. You are my sanctifier. You are my spirit baptizer. You are my healer. You are my coming King. And you are also my teacher. You are my instructor. Friends, let's decide today to seek God in His Word and to be instructed. Let's be instructed and grow together. And to close this out, Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. I love this passage. It's so visionary. And here it is, we see this constellation of terms come together in this beautiful picture of what Paul and indeed Christ desires for his church. It says this, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip. See that word again? Katatasimon, towards the completion of his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach, all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. That's a terrible cluster of words at the end. He's he's really sticking it into them, but it must have been a real problem in that early church. If you ever notice, whenever God shines a bright light and does a great work, the enemy comes and develops a strategy and a plan to take people off course. Friends, when you're instructed in the Word, when you know the Word of God, when you walk in the ways of His wisdom and discernment, you will know when things aren't right. And this is how we preserve the integrity of the powerful teaching of God and the love of God. See, here in this verse here in, in, in uh, Ephesians 4. Paul sees his role just not as an apostle, as a church father and leader, but also a teacher and instructor of the Word of God. He desires the people, as you can see, the progression that we move from knowledge towards maturity and bring praise and glory to our God. So as I sort of summarise these thoughts, and we're going to come to a time of prayer in a moment, the challenge here 
seems really, really clear in my mind as I've read and devoured and sort of created a theology of instruction based on the Word of God. There is a clear biblical theme towards transformation and it is pointed out as needing the work of Holy Spirit in the believer's life to achieve this. And one of the greatest strengths of our churches is something that must be laid at the forefront of our mission. We must seek God in His Word and desire to be instructed by God. Can I say this? This instruction, this development will not happen by chance, but some of us need to take deliberate steps today and say, God, this night before I go to bed, I want to open the Word again with fresh eyes and say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to hold the Word up here. I'm not going to bring the Word down to the level of my circumstance and my experience. I'm going to decide today to have a higher value of the Word of God. And for some of you, like I, I do Bible reading class, how to read it, play that Mercy Me song, Word of God Speak. Before you open the Word of God, you deliberately position your heart, you posture your heart and say, God, I want you to be Lord of this Bible reading session. I'm not going to just flick through and cherry pick verses, but God, I want to maybe take a passage and I'm not going to move from this passage until you speak to me and I'm challenged to the core about something that you want me to change. God led me through a passage last week and I spent two days in it out of 1 Peter and it says, why men's prayers, why husbands' prayers sometimes aren't answered, why your prayers are hindered. Some of you, that might be your project. Go find what God was speaking to Pastor Andrew about in 1 Peter 2 and 3. How's that? I left you a little tease there. Don't look at it right now because we're about to pray. But for some of you, that is what you may need to do. These Scripture texts talk about serious, critical engagement and literally bowing our minds and our hearts down to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and say, God, wash me in Your Word. Speak to me in Your Word this morning. God, we don't want to be known as people who just focus on the knowledge of God, but we want to know to be known for the wisdom and the discernment of God. Friends, I'd encourage us to take seriously this instruction in the Word of God to be instructed by His Word. And let's seek God in His Word and let's desire and humble ourselves to be more like Him. I know for me in my early 20s, I was the first person in my family to do higher education. I was doing a business degree and I just realised that as a young believer I needed more and our church had a ministry college on a Monday night and I just subscribed and started doing one subject of the semester on a Monday night just to lift the level of my God had a journey of me God Andrew I want you to worship me with your mind I remember seeing the first class I did was Holy Spirit and I thought Holy Spirit was first mentioned in the Bible in the book of Acts a little on the night when I was blown away and He was there in Genesis 1, the Creator with God, brooding, hovering, creative genius, partner with God the Father, progenitor, source, and the Son was all there. Remember my mind being blown, if that was the case, if Holy Spirit was right at the beginning, He's had this long range plan of empowering His believers. Mine was just blown away on a Monday night and I began to read textbooks of learned people and, and the Word of God came alive. I had the Word of God there and other textbooks from great theologians and other ministers. And I literally began to bring those two thoughts together. And the youth ministry I was leading began to explode with growth and get results that my peers weren't getting. People would say to me, what's different about you? I said, look, I'm believing God, but I'm doing some serious study. I'm taking the call of God seriously on my life. And I remember beginning reading the Word of God and memorising it and using the principles. It was like fire shut up in my bones and I could feel the deep work of God. I could feel something shifting inside me. Something inside me was shifting. And I began to flourish in new ways. As I said, in the age of 30, after sort of a 10-year accounting business career, God said, Andrew, I want you to get out of the book of Numbers, wink, wink, and get into the book of Acts. And I remember just literally liquidating my whole life at the time, pardon the pun, and literally went to ministry college. I felt, God, I want you to do three years serious study for me. I'm preparing you for your next phase, the next journey. So fast forward 20 plus years later, planning churches, serving on boards, consulting, coaching, just being part of God's plan to strengthen His wonderful uh, group people called His church. It was just a massive 
a massive uh, joy and I'm living that joy now. Can I say, friends, I don't say those things to impress you, but to impress upon you the need to be instructed by the Word of God. God is looking for people who know His Word, who move in wisdom, who move in discernment, who take seriously the call of God to prepare themselves for effective service. Behind me is something we do in City Point Ministry College and we're going to have an information session after we pray for some people. But I love this idea that preparation positions you for influence. And before anything else, preparation is the key to success. It's, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look across this room. There's a solid church under great leadership. God is speaking to people even right now. And I've been praying that God will be stirring up something afresh in you. Some of you got calls and giftings. You know that God is preparing something for you to do in the future. Could I, could I suggest this? You need to prepare for the time because when the time comes, you won't have time to prepare for it then. One of my mentors, Pastor Dave McDonald, one of the spiritual fathers of the INC movement, when I was at ministry college, he would lead chapel and he told one of the scariest stories one day. He said, I have this recurring nightmare, this dream. He says, I've got a full suit on. I'm carrying a briefcase. I'm running to a plane that's going overseas. I've got a first class ticket. I'm about to get on the plane. They say, sorry, sir, you can't get on the plane. You got no shoes on. You got no shoes on. They wouldn't let him on the plane. But I got the ticket. It's my destiny. You can't get on the plane. You got no shoes. And he was just horrified. My feet have not been prepared with the gospel of peace. We need to get prepared, friends. We're ready at time where God's gonna, we're gonna get a call. It's ready to go, friends. And I'd, I'd encourage you, some of you, to take your preparation really, really seriously. We put this slide up. There are three ways to study ministry. Now me, the first one was this. I was an accountant. I always thought I was going to be an accountant. And I, and I used Bible study on a Monday night to get my Christian worldview, my spiritual, my thinking right so that I could apply those principles to my profession. I didn't know that church planning and preaching was going to be coming after that. But it helped me become a better professional person along the way. For some of you, you just do it for pure personal development. We say this, that you can meander on your own study along the way, just do a bit of Bible study here, do a bit of a course here. We literally compress 10 years of study that you do on your own into 10 months. We say, give God a year. Why don't you fast track? We've got a lot of young people who leave high school and say, before I go into my university, I want to give God a year. The first decision I make as a young adult, my decision is, I want to invest 10 months getting my head, heart, hands right, ready to go in my sphere of influence and my profession. So you don't get messed up by some of the left-wing ideology that you find in some of our universities. Set yourself up for success. Set yourself up well. And for some of you, there's a group of people, and this is amazing if God has called you to do this, you know that God has tapped you on the shoulder. You may not have the clarity for it. You know you carry tomorrow's anointing, but you know that you have to do or ask some questions about what sort of coaching, mentoring, ministry opportunity, what work placement, some higher ed study along the way, which will get you to where you need to go. There are many ways to learn, friends, but could I say this? Many of us learn from the School of Hard Knocks. School of Hard Knocks, you don't get fee help and off study with that. And could I say, make that not the only way that you learn over a 50, 60 year life, all right? There are other ways. Some people don't smarter than us, better than us, and they can help fast track this to get where we need to go. It's possible to grow together, find a tribe, and God will help us to become the people of God. So normally I say this is a bunch of things that students say and blah, blah, blah. I'll I'll say that in the information session after our time together, all right? So for the... Can I pray? Pray God will help us, eh? God, we thank You for Your Word. We love Your Word, God. Literally, Your Word has transformed my life. Your Word is as activating an ongoing chain reaction of transformation in many of the lives of the people in this room. God, I know you're saying to some people today, God, we don't want to be an add-on anymore. Your call doesn't want to be a fit-in. We want to take seriously what you're calling us to do. So please help us. For those who you're speaking to right now, it's time. I pray to give them wisdom and creative solutions, how they're going to reorganise their life to fit more of you in. God, I pray that you'll help us to seek you in your word, to come under your lordship and to be instructed. 
and to grow. God, I thank you. Your power is also present to heal right now. You're wanting to transform lives and bring hope where there's pain and bring clarity where there's confusion. Help us as we pray together in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Well, I'm going to invite your pastor back in a moment, but my wife and I, we usually, when we travel, we love to pray with people. And um, as we're sitting in the front row there, the worship was way hard. I just felt God's power and presence all over my body, which is a good sign that God's presence. And if you want prayer for healing, or you'd like us to stand in agreement with you for a breakthrough or some clarity in your life, my wife and I are happy to pray with you. And then we'll do that for some moments. Maybe we'll hover over here come down and pray we can stand pray in prayer of faith and agreement with you and part with your pastors to see the work of God come into your situation and come into your life and there'll be a bit of a break and then I think in one of the rooms we're going to be having a bit of an information centre you know you've walked in the right room where there'll be two fancy banners and some nice glossy brochures but it's not going to be a hard sell I really want to give people just a reasonable option and if CMC is not the college option for you I can probably recommend at least five or six other ones that may suit your needs, all right? I just love seeing people take their next step towards maturity because our maturity and growth, like a crack of fire, means we burn and we burn and we do not burn out. We continue, our lives continue to produce heat and warmth and hope to a hurting community around us. In Jesus' name, God bless you all. Thank you.